calibrating your 3D printer is essential for best results. Today, we check out the calibration tools built right into Super Slicer and see how they compare to those on my free calibration website. A while ago, I made a video on the best free slicer that you might not have heard of, Super Slicer. At the time, I had requests to make more tutorials once I had become more familiar, and earlier this week, I covered variables and conditional G-code, and in this video, we're going to check out the inbuilt calibration tools. The ready printer calibration is a topic I care much about, because I've made two videos explaining my free website, which is dedicated to calibration. For some procedures, it supplies step-by-step -step instructions to follow, and then for other tests, it provides G-code that you customize by putting in the size and other parameters of your printer, which can then be downloaded from the browser, ready to print on your machine. I'm proud of my website, but everything has pros and cons, and the main limitation of my website is that all of the G-code is pre-sliced before JavaScript is used to replace and modify it according to the user's preferences. That means that sometimes you'll have trouble translating the results from the website to your own slicer. So today we explore an alternative, the calibration built directly into Super Slicer. The advantage here is that this calibration is built on all of your existing printer settings, which means you adjust whatever value you're testing and there's nothing else to translate. Let's work our way through these tests one by one in order. You might not have noticed before, but there is a calibration menu and we should start by reading the introduction. This is how this format works. A separate box will be opened up. We can expand it and then read the contents within. In summary, it tells you to do these in order, kicking off with extruder calibration as well as bed leveling. For each step calibration, the Super Slicer documentation is a little bit limited, so I instead followed the step-by-step -step instructions on my own website. My target printer is a Sovol SV04. I marked a line at 120 millimeters of filament slowly extruded 100 millimeters worth and found there was roughly 20 millimeters left, roughly inside the margin of error of the width of a Sharpie. Next up, bed leveling. At the start of my process, I actually missed the generate button down in the corner, but if you click it, you'll have a test pattern created that puts a shape in each corner of the bed as well as the middle. This is exactly what my website produces, so thinking it was my only option, I generated the test print and used it to adjust the first layer, bringing it down until I had a good amount of squish. Both sources have some nice diagrams for determining how far away the nozzle should be to get a nice first layer. Before we run any further tests, we need to do a bit of slicer prep. Normally when we 3D print multiple objects, they're printed layer by layer all at the same time. But all of these super slicer tests print multiple objects one after each other, what's known as sequentially. So we need to ensure that there's enough of a gap between each object so that the print head doesn't smash into the others that are already printed. To ensure this, we'll come to our print settings and then come to output options for the printer profile that we'll be using. The value we need to change is called extruder clearance, specifically the radius, and the default value of 20 millimeters will probably put the objects too close together and cause a collision. The exact value you need will depend on your printer and how physically big the print head is. What I would recommend is setting it to something large like 80 to 100 millimeters, and if the prints don't fit, you can lower it afterwards. With these basics out of the way, we can move on to the filament flow calibration. And this is one test where I think the inbuilt Super Slicer version has the clear advantage. Now the flow test on my site gets you to print a cube with a single perimeter of known width, and then we measure this with accurate calipers and use the calculator to adjust the flow rate as necessary. But the Super Slicer test takes a completely different approach, printing some objects back to back so we can see the effect of the flow rate change in context. There's two steps to this test and each time there'll be five variations which we'll compare and pick the best one. We run the first of the two tests by clicking on the button in the lower left, generate 10% intervals around current value. In the background, something magical has happened, and if we close this window, we can see that all the hard work has been done for us with five different objects. Over on the right, if we click on the top line for each of these, it'll tell you what values have been adjusted. And the one we're interested in here is under filament and extrusion multiplier. One test will run your current value. Another two will run minus 10 and minus 20% of your current value. 
and the last two will run plus 10 and plus 20% of your current value. With the test prepared, it's time to launch it on the printer. And hopefully, like what you're seeing here, you'll find the five items print one after each other. Comparing them with such a big gap in between is difficult, so it makes sense to peel them off and then line them up. The instructions tell us to aim for the lowest that does not create gaps in the top surface, as well as looking at the circle. It might not be clear on camera, but both my minus 20 and minus 10 have gaps, and I thought my best result was perhaps a little bit over zero, so for demonstration's sake, I'll go with the plus 10. My existing extrusion multiplier was 0.96, and I need to go to 10% higher than that. So that's going to be 1.1 multiplied by 0.96, which gives us 1.056, which I rounded to 1.05 and updated in my slicer profile accordingly. We can now bring back up the dialog and run the second test, generating a range of intervals at minus 2% from our baseline. We run the next calibration print, peel them off and compare once more. I decided that the best version was minus six. So again, a quick calculation, minus six equals 94% or 0.94. And we multiply this by our current value, which for this test was 1.05. And that will give me my final extrusion multiplier, which I'm going to round to 0.99. Once again, I updated my profile and saved. Flow rate calibration complete. And that's a good representation of how these tests function. So let's move on to the next. Next up is a temperature tuning tower, which is similar to the approach on my website and many other places. The instructions explain that we're creating a tower with our inputs in the lower left. Again, everything goes around the baseline which is 200 degrees in my case. You can decide how big the temperature steps are, as well as how many steps up and down from that baseline to generate. I decided on two five degree steps down and four five degree steps up. And that will generate a tower in my case, going from 220 degrees that drops down to 190 as the print progresses. Let's continue by printing and then observing. We have several things to inspect here. The quality of the overhangs on each side, the quality of the fine details in the left hand spike, any stringing that's present, which in this case is far more prominent in the lower hotter regions. Another thing we can look for is the gloss of the filament, which will tend to go up the hotter it is. Visual inspection tells me I'm likely to stick with 200 degrees, but to be sure, we can break the model on purpose. Firstly, snapping these spires, but I found that they broke equally easy at any temperature range, probably because they're so skinny. And then secondly, trying to break the model in half. All things equal, this should break in the middle, but for me, it broke in the 195 section, whereas when I purposely snapped it in the 200 section, the layers didn't separate as easily, telling me that's not a bad value. So 200 degrees, I'm going to keep. Our next calibration test is for retraction. The test on my website I quite like, as it allows you to change up to five things over six bands, so it's very adaptable. However, of all of those on my website, this is the one test that's hardest to translate to other slices. Therefore, this retraction calibration in build will have everything besides what we're testing already in place, giving it tremendous utility. Let's examine our settings. Firstly, the step, which for direct drive should be 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters or 0.5 for a Bowden setup. This is how quickly the retraction will increase as we go up the tower. I decided to stick with the default 0.2. The height will decide when the test ends, and again, I stuck with the default 15 millimeters. The start temp is your baseline temperature, which I kept at 200 to match my slicer profile. If you'd like to test if lowering the nozzle temperature will reduce stringing, you can set temp decrease to a value other than one test. And for demonstration's sake, I'm going to go two times 10 degrees. Finally, remove filament slowdown should be set to match whatever you have in your profile. I generally have this off, so I clicked this button. And after clicking generate, here is my result. I have two tests, one at 200 degrees and the other at 190. The retraction starts at zero at the bottom, but every millimeter upwards increases by 0.2, with the test ending at a height of 15 millimeters, which means the retraction at its maximum value will be three millimeters. Like before, these tests are sequential. So my 200 degree test completes first, followed by my 190 degree test. And here are my results with the 190 degree tower. We can see I have some stringing on the lowest levels, but it cleans up quite quickly. The 200 degree tower is more or less the same. Some stringing when the retraction is more or less turned off, which cleans up quickly. 
Previously, I ran this same test using TPU instead of PLA and found it less forgiving, with the stringing not really clearing up until halfway up the tower at 7.5 millimeters. Now we do a little bit of maths. If my good height was 7.5 millimeters, I times that by the step that I used, 0.2, and that will tell me at that stage I had 1.5 millimeters of retraction. And that's the value I chose to run for each of my extruders on this IDEX. In my opinion, what we've covered so far is integral to getting good prints. So what follows you can consider optional. Our next test concerns bridges, not only the traditional bridges like this, but also above infill inside our model, where Super Slicer will add internal bridge infill in an effort to smooth the path for the solid layers above. Unfortunately, the documentation for this bridge flow ratio calibration seems a little bit unfinished, but leaving the settings on default will give us five different values to test. Once more, we print the G-code and then inspect. With no guidance, I thought I should check the underside and simply looked for the cleanest, most consistent extrusion. And in my case, I thought that was the test that was labeled 90%. The parameter that's changing for each model is called bridge flow ratio. And if you're unfamiliar with any of the things you're meant to be tuning, you can use the magnifying glass, type in the setting, and then when you click it, it will be highlighted in the window so you know where to change. From the test, I established my value should be 90, so that's what I input before saving the profile. Our final test is for ironing pattern calibration. And if you're not sure what ironing is, here's a quick demo. Generally, our models are printed with solid infill on top. But optionally, by using ironing, we can bring the nozzle and slide it back and forth across the surface, smoothing out the top even more. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison, and with ironing enabled as seen on the right, we get a much smoother surface. This test is pretty straightforward and is split into two parts. For the first test, we're looking for the lowest value on which the top surface is smooth without rough holes. To generate it, we click over bridge calibration. This will generate a series of six items, which we once again print and then compare. On my item labeled 100, we can see the rough holes that are described in the instructions. But when we step up to 105, we can see these are gone. So that's the value that I went for. Back in Super Slicer, we can search for the value above bridge flow ratio, which I changed from 125 to 105 and then saved. We can now run the second test, top flow calibration, which will generate another series of six items, but this time changing a different setting. Like before, clicking on the right and scrolling down will tell us that the parameter that varies is the top fill flow ratio. To work through each of these tests does take a little bit of time, but individually they're actually quite fast and use very little filament. Here's the second set lined up, and this time I simply went for the most aesthetic top surface. In my case, I thought 100 was reasonable, but decided that 110 was actually the most consistent. So I changed the top fill from 96 to 110 and saved my profile. There is actually a final test to spawn a calibration cube, but once again, I would consider this entirely optional. And that's Super Slicer's inbuilt calibration tools. There are some tests here that are missing on my website and some tests on my website that are missing from here. I just think it's great that we have multiple free options to use as we please. Let me know below if you've used these before or if you're gonna give them a try now and maybe suggestions for how they can be improved. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy calibrated 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you wanna see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really wanna support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.